Remember back in the day when you had a carrier pigeon? <laughs> yeah. Just make a call. How do the lights work? I was touching the wrong buttons instead of the screen. Stupid me to press the buttons instead of the screen. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this is really an embarrassment of riches over the past week from having uh, our Italian colleagues and friends come and bring Botticelli's works into open boxes and see masterpieces to having three nights of openings. Um, hopefully you came. There were 600 total Friday night when the uh, Italian ambassador got to speak. And I hope that um, Melissa will call me. We have a full overflow crowd at the museum watching on Facebook Live, uh, both on the internet, uh, on, our, on our Facebook page, and also in the museum. So Melissa said if for some reason the audio wasn't coming through, she would send a carrier pigeon <laughs> by my phone in my pocket. So um, we're really excited. How many people saw the article in the Wall Street Journal today? Well, good, only 30%. So um, there was a major feature story in the Wall Street Journal today um, and online. And of course, that's, that's millions and millions of media impressions. And across the world. And how many of you all came to the Tuesday night topics in architecture? Monday. Monday night, sorry. Okay, about 20%. So good, only 20% is going to hear what I said then. Um, two weeks ago, Artnet News, one of the top internet art news sites, um, ran the story of the Botticelli exhibition. And what they do then on Saturdays is they take the 10 most popular stories and put out a list of 10. Well, the Botticelli was number one in the world. So, um, so we have many people to thank for that, and including, and you're going to hear from uh, John Spike. Uh, you know, no one could have done this, um, and, and I've said that now more than once on these exhibitions. Uh, the expertise just simply doesn't exist in a way to spin a narrative and tell a story. Uh, the way that John does it, and the way that our wonderful staff uh, works with our international colleagues to then pull off. Um, you know, they don't just deliver these works, you pull them out of the box, and put them up, move them around. You have to actually take the work from a box to a condition report, to its spot on the wall, and it doesn't change. So it all has to be very pre-planned. -pre and so for those of you asking us, which I am starting to hate, uh, what are you going to do next? <laughs> I'm not so much sure how many rabbits we have to pull out of this old busted up hat. Um, but we may have one or two, in fact. Um, another bit of good news, uh, just this afternoon we finished negotiations um, to get to signing our contract with our architect. And I know that I have broken the rules in the past and mentioned who that architect is. But I can tell you as an alum who sat in this room 30 years ago for many, many hours of classes, um, to come back to your alma mater and work with a top five architect in the world uh, on a building at one of the greatest, most historic and prestigious universities in America is, is daunting and it's humbling and we really appreciate it. Um, so before we get started, um, I wanted to talk about brand value. Um, EDB is the sponsor of our Third Thursday Lectures, and um, I don't think Botticelli has been associated with a bank since <laughs> Renzo the Mag Magnificent and the Medici Bank. So I told Mark I had some special things from tonight, so we're likening Mark Hanna here in the front row, their generosity, his brilliance to line up Botticelli, EDB. Lorenzo the Magnificent was his name, and the Medici Bank, really the first significant franchised uh, banking and checking institution in the, in, the, in the world. So we want to thank EBB and Mark and his colleagues. This has been um, now many years of their support of this. It's a wonderful relationship. I understand from Mark we're going to be changing the logo and the name again uh, soon. They're involved in another merger, which has been announced, and so uh, we'll make sure that Mark's face stays the same, okay. the logo and the name changes, but we, we really uh, appreciate the fact that a rising tide floats all the boats. So, um, you all have heard John Spike speak for many, many years, and that's why there is a total overflow crowd in the museum. Uh, we will have the EDB reception afterwards, so if you all make your way over there, it's just, uh, and join us in our celebration in our community of this embarrassment of riches. So, thank you very much, John. Thank you. microphone is 
one that doesn't come up to your face. You have to just talk at it. So I hope the folks can hear over there. I'm already receiving complaints from the overflow audience <laughs> in the museum. And uh, reading between the lines, uh, I better speak quickly and get this over with so that the drinks and refreshments are still there <laughs> when we arrive. I mean, I think I uh, detect a veiled uh, threat. <laughs> Melissa Paris, is this loud enough? Today, I'm going to uh, talk about the exhibition um, from a uh, different uh, perspective from when I spoke about the exhibition when it was coming. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to go deeper into the works, and I'm going to talk about uh, how do we know um, what we know. How do we know that these works are by these artists, and how do we uh, know what the dates of them are? Being able to uh, identify the works correctly, being uh, able to uh, date them with uh, some accuracy, are uh, sine qua non first steps towards understanding them. And this is, in fact, also uh, the theme of our exhibition, that's on the ground floor in the museum. That's called the Art and Science of Connoisseurship, in which we explain how uh, those names uh, come about, where they come from, uh, to what extent uh, they are new, and so forth. Now, drum roll, please. How many people recall seeing this slide before? This was the last slide I showed last November when I gave the talk. And I did so to say, we're going to pull this off, and there's going to be a show in February 2017. There's an Italian uh, expression, una promessa e un dovere, a promise is an obligation. And uh, we have confirmation that we did pull it off <laughs> in this uh, superlative uh, full-page review that came out today in the Wall Street Journal. And this continues it, and uh, this will go out on uh, their news network and uh, will um, carry the muscarelli, or as the Italian uh, couriers say, the muscarelli, <laughs> the muscarelli standardo, banner ever higher. Here are some uh, scenes to refresh your memory or to uh, give you a start um, if you haven't uh, had an opportunity yet to see the exhibition upstairs. And uh, the the key to this exhibition uh, is apparent to all visitors. Uh, it's very carefully laid out with sight lines that unite the works and uh, suggest the uh, rapport between them, and there is. And uh, the Italian uh, couriers, all of whom know these works, uh, first of all, when they entered the space because of the ambience that we created, they gasped. They gasped with surprise. They didn't imagine it would be possible to show them these familiar works in a new way. And then they said to me, the works, the way you've arranged them, are like voices speaking to each other. The pictures speak to each other across the room and down the walls. And then they gave me credit for all kinds of juxtapositions that I had not intended. <laughs> but following the wise words of St. Francis de Sal, who said, it is always necessary to tell the truth, it is not always necessary to speak. <laughs> I smiled sympathetically when I received credit for terrific things uh, that were um, happy uh, happenstance. In this first room, and I'm going to uh, surprise you because that's very much my uh, character. Uh, I love to um, fulfill expectations you didn't have. 
The first room is about his formation, and uh, it's his formation with his master, Filippo Lippi. In studying Italian art, the first thing you uh, need to know always is who was the master uh, of this artist you're studying, um, who uh, was his teacher. And uh, those of us who study Italian art know uh, hierarchies, family trees of artist and pupil, artist and pupil. And it's extremely significant that uh, Botticelli uh, had the benefit of studying under the uh, great early Renaissance uh, master named Filippo Lippi, who was the only uh, pupil of um, Masaccio. And I'm going to explain to you a bit of what that means. Now, the three works that are in a row on the left-hand wall are all uh, from before the birth of uh, Botticelli in 1445. And uh, it was asked uh, of me, uh, how do we know that these works are by him? They are so different. And I said, well, there's actually 10 years difference uh, time between them, and uh, we know the other works that go uh, with it. Here are two of the works there. You see one's of the early 1430s, and he studies with Masaccio in the year 1426. And the other one, uh, which looks very different, uh, is from around 1440. So how do we know these are even by the same painter? Well, it is because we know the paintings around them and in between them. And I'm going to show you just a few examples of this. And when you're done, you'll be amongst the leading art historians in the world. <laughs> I wouldn't waste your time unless we aim for the top. Here we have uh, three panels from what Masaccio did in 1426 after he had finished the part of the Brancacci Chapel he was going to do. Uh, this is a larger figure. The polyptych of Pisa uh, was dismantled and it is divided mostly between the museums in London and Berlin and that's St. Paul. And then these are two small figures of uh, uh, saints that were in uh, vertical columns. And in 1996, if I am not mistaken, uh, in my book on uh, Masaccio, I uh, said I thought that the far right uh, 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 Carmelite saint there, the, there's no other name known for it. We don't know who it is, so we call this one the beardless Carmelite saint. I thought that was by the young Filippo Levy. And that becomes very important because uh, the sources are vague about whether he studied really with Masaccio, but if he painted a piece in a work by Masaccio, well, that settles the discussion. And in uh, the early part of the new century, uh, uh, because the uh, Getty Museum required, acquired a uh, saint uh, related uh, to this uh, piece by Masaccio, related to this, uh, or so they say, uh, uh, altarpiece, the Polyptic of Pisa, the chap said, um, very politely not mentioning me, lest my feelings be hurt, uh, he said he thought this was by Filippo Lippi. That was scholarly irony I was <laughs> indulging in a second ago. Um, <laughs> but I'm just happy he did, because <coughs> there you have it, confirmation, from peers, and uh, let me show you why uh, I think. I showed this uh, to you uh, last time, this little uh, uh, visual aid here. See the blue things are the part of the painting the, that in this uh, Filippo Di Pino show are like the scene on the right, which is in Berlin. The yellow are more typical of uh, Masaccio, who is, uh, doesn't care uh, to get the forms as volumetric, as round. Everything that uh, the beardless Carmelite saint, you see, he makes things bulk out, the head is round. And uh, Masaccio is more of a painter. He loves uh, color, too. Whereas um, it's not a particular interest of uh, Filippo. Here is another early work by uh, Filippo Lippi. Uh, 
uh, commonly accepted. And so you see, well, this is what we're thinking of. I'm trying to teach you that the works in the show stand in the front of, of a line that goes far back. And it's always this way. Uh, when you uh, take a course, audit a course, uh, I just learned, I'm going to take advantage of it right away, that since I'm over 60, I can audit the classes for free. Uh, this is uh, these curious doll-like figures. Because he only studied one year with Masaccio. He never had anatomical training. He really was a giant genius because he's uh, truly self-taught, Filippo Lippi. Uh, at left, I show you the Masaccio uh, center of that uh, polyptych uh, so that you will see something that will make a lot more uh, sense when I show this to you. Look where Filippo Lippi got this idea of the uh, saints and angels and the child being these uh, uh, chubby cherubs doing natural things. Uh, it's very unusual. I never saw it before. The uh, infant Christ is stuffing himself with Eucharistic uh, symbolic grapes. It's typical of uh, Fra Filippo Lippi to try to put lifelike gestures into his works, and he had a year with a man who was uh, the first to do it, uh, and it was influential for him, and this becomes part of uh, Botticelli's greatness. The gestures are lifelike, only he uh, tends to make them uh, more refined. So I want to show you um, the, this pair again, and uh, show you on the right well, it does seem to have made some progress in the inter. Um, this is to wake up those who are not at home. <laughs> and if uh, you're a rare uh, glimpse of my uh, lack of self-confidence, uh, there's lots of them uh, in the uh, show. Uh, plus, it's fascinating. <laughs> well, when you look at, um, for all you budding connoisseurs, when you look at a work of art, you must uh, test yourself, uh, because you want to know this, what is the condition of the work? What parts are restoration? Uh, how, how much uh, is a filled in crack by a restorer? Because these, these works are 500 years old and they have suffered all kinds of indignities and natural chemical changes. But this one is particularly fascinating, and it is uh, one of the reasons I was so intent on uh, getting this loan for our show. You see, before, and aren't these very clear slides? I mean, give me credit, look at that. Before restoration, box slash after restoration, 2016. Uh, does anyone see a difference between these pictures? Or am I just <laughs> deluding myself? At the dentist's office as a kid, that's what I love to do. Find seven changes <laughs> in this picture. Little did I know it would make it my career. <laughs> At any rate, um, on the left-hand side, besides uh, a, uh, a rogue leg, um, there's all this uh, uh, cloudy stuff coming down the, you know, the background. And that is uh, muck, technical term. That is accumulated uh, debris on the surface, um, liquids, and uh, the uh, varnish itself uh, is aging uh, in an uneven way after, you know, a certain number of uh, decades. and. Uh, that it was to get rid of that, to make the work more presentable for exhibition, that, uh, to their amazement, and I was talking to a scholar who had published this picture before, and was trying to argue with me that um, actually uh, the left-hand side was uh, fine, that this was what's called a pentamento, but it's not the way pentamentos come off, believe you me, or come up. So you see, they painted over the top of the side of the uh, sarcophagus there and added in some uh, that polychrome stone, which is very important. It's a symbol of 
heaven, uh, and over on the right hand side we see how it was. Now, it's not surprising somebody painted over that lake because it's very, very awkward. That is why I love it. He so, who was talking to me before about, I want to know more about how nature relates to these things. He is trying to be more natural. So instead of having everybody stand up like soldiers, he says, I'll have uh, John the uh, Evangelist here uh, uh, steadying himself against the wall of the tomb, I'll put my leg over it, as might have been done at the moment, but he doesn't have a sufficient knowledge of anatomy to pull it off. It looks really ridiculous. <laughs> so probably an early 20th century uh, art dealer uh, fixed that up. <laughs> but it is the most wonderful example of what it was like to be Fra Filippo Lippi, uh, trying to uh, do all things at all time. Now, there was another influence on him. He wasn't the number one painter with the uh, Medici. There was a much more sophisticated and learned and much better behaved painter named uh, Fra Angelico. I say the behaved because Fra Filippo Lippi, as soon as he'd uh, gotten some success, arranged to be the tutor of some nuns in Prato and ran off with one of them. <laughs> and uh, the painter Filippo Lippi in our show uh, was their son. Any great for Angelica was much better behaved, and um, he was also more intellectual. Uh, he is trying to make uh, timeless and very symbolic images, the one at left, and he puts in uh, this rock and this tomb and the, uh, the body of the deceased Christ is being displayed in a cruciform pose, and all of this is uh, overlapping uh, the significances of it. Um, this motif is called uh, Corpus Domini, uh, a it's a feast, it was written about by a Dominican, uh, St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, and Frangelica was a Dominican. The Carmelites at right, that's who uh, the order of Filippo Lippi, they uh, trace their origin back to the hillsides in the Sinai and Holy Land, and they were a lot more relaxed. <laughs> but anyway, he is trying to get a layer of um, poetic depth from Fra Filippo which he wasn't before, because he's competing with Fra Angelico. Behind him, that astonishing uh, rock hole there, well, that must allude to the tomb, but in the position of the thing, it's a favorite motif of Frangelico. It only rhymes in English, the coincidence of womb and tomb, because Christ emerges alive from both the womb and the tomb. And Christ is born in order to die. This is solid uh, theology. Around the time, here's a work from around the time, so how do we write circa 1440? Well, this is a work, we don't have dated works for even, you know, two within a five year period, there's very few, but here is a work, and the uh, drapery folds are getting uh, a little bit more uh, elaborate, uh, slightly more elegant. The background uh, on this, uh, meaning the one we have, the Pieta, is uh, rather uh, adroitly done, and in this, uh, it's called the Barbadori altarpiece, came out of uh, Santo Spirito, um, that's in the Louvre today. He got quite good at the architectural background. We still see the same cherubs pretending to be angels. In 1445, he does this uh, for uh, Santa Croce, and notice, uh, again, it's a little bit like ours. Everyone's pushed up to the front plane and lined up in a row. And the third painting that I'm not pausing uh, to talk about, we don't have all night, um, the champagne is uh, warming. Uh, uh, on that wall, uh, is of this time, and uh, that's why we know the other one. Uh, on the wall by him. The third I referred to is from around this date. 
Here we look past, I rather love this picture because of the letters reflected in the Filippo Lippi, and we look at the wall beyond, and we're going to talk about that. And uh, there it is at left, a Filippo Lippi on assistance. Uh, this is a small, uh, rather well done picture, but everyone realizes that um, it's a little too simple to be by uh, Fra Filippo Lippi, and plus he was totally busy painting the enormous fresco cycles he painted at the end of his life, multi-year projects in Prato and Spoleto. Um, but when they uh, offered this to us in consolation for not giving us something else that, that we had agreed for six months previously that we were going to get, um, I was, uh, you know, somewhat um, skeptical about it, but I looked into it and realized that uh, the face of this angel is uh, certainly by Botticelli while in the workshop of Filippo Lippi. And remember I, I said that we get these loans because we promise to add to our knowledge about things. On the right hand side is a picture by Botticelli that copies a uh, Lippi, it's in the Innocenti, and um, this was accepted when it first was, came to light in the 1860s, and then in the 20th century, in the 20th century, there was a great excitement amongst scholars to say everything wasn't by the artist. And uh, we ended up with a, a clearer picture, but actually the picture was incomplete. And now, um, by and large, people are understanding again why this has to be um, uh, Botticelli. And um, what you can see here is uh, and, and this is, we're losing a little resolution here, but I studied a high-res photograph of it, which you can see more in it than you can with an enlargement of a high-res photograph. You can see more in it than you can with your naked eye. Has anybody recently, say two years ago, seen a very important exhibition of another great artist of this time who uh, was able to put in details you couldn't see with your naked eye? He was seven years younger than Monticelli. His middle name was Da. <laughs> I mean, I give up. <laughs> the subtlety of the modeling of this face says something about the quality of the skin. It's refined uh, as though it's transparent. It's so smooth. And the gradations, it's impossible to see the strokes that make these gradations that uh, model the volume of the cheeks. And this is super work. The only other painter, I mean, I have to know who the other painters are in the workshop, and the only other one of note is named uh, Fra Diamante, and he is coarse and heavy. No uh, worrying about him. And um, this Innocente picture is particularly interesting because it's directly based on a very famous uh, Filippo Lippi that for some months Aaron and I fantasized we were going to get here without them noticing they had lent us one of the most important pictures in the Uffizi. <laughs> but I don't know, the spell passed and uh, they said, uh, I, the Italian equivalent to us of, are you mad? <laughs> well, so, the, when the painting uh, by Borcelli, very young, still in the studio, uh, fell out of favor in the 20th century, because uh, it seems so clear, well, the Lippi is so much better. But, I mean, let's bear in mind, he's 20 years old, and he's doing different things. Workshop stuff is to replicate the master. What is he doing? Instead of the interesting uh, different, uh, distance between uh, Our Lady and the Lippi where she folds her hands in adoration, actually Botticelli adds to the intimacy she reaches to take the child. He eliminates one of the uh, two angels whose eyes are covered by uh, the infant's uh, arm there, and it's a, this is a typical Filippo Lippi motif where they're all jammed in those pictures. I've showed you a few. And uh, Botticelli has uh, an innate neatness. He loves outlines and he's a 
wonderful drawer of outlines, which you feel when you look at the painting I write, and actually when you look at the, I have a thing here. Let's see. <laughs> when you look at this face, or this face, you do not say to yourself, I simply love the outlines on that. <laughs> now he doesn't care about the outlines. He's always trying to make things volumetric. But this chap, everything is done with the most exquisite line. I almost feel that we've done enough. What do you think? We go get a drink. <laughs> well, let me know. Let me know. Well, uh, we're leaving that part now, and we're entering the large gallery, and we have this painting here, over which uh, we, as a uh, team, the staff, is, uh, there's a few of us that we discuss every uh, decision together. You know, is it confusing to have a picture not by Botticelli right there? Well, so far no complaints. It says there it's not in. And this is important, this work by Pliovolo, for reasons I'll show you. It's the transition, the influence of uh, the two brothers, Pliovolo, their name is an elegant expression, chicken seller. <laughs> Uh, uh, without uh, their intervention, uh, he, they, he wouldn't have become who he was. Yeah. <laughs> so here is that Lippi that is lined up on the axis of the exhibition, and uh, you can see it from any place in the show. And he did this in the time, 1466, uh, when uh, Botticelli was working with him, and then he goes to Spoleto, and Botticelli goes and opens his uh, studio in his family house in uh, near Ogni Santi, across the street from the Excelsior Hotel um, in Florence, and you see how uh, close they are. They're very close, and the intimacy and tenderness of the embrace of mother and child is a specialty of Filippo Lippi that uh, Botticelli was sensitive to. He, uh, his uh, model for Our Lady is more lifelike. You can still see people in the streets of uh, Florence have this uh, lovely face, and actually nobody looks like that. Uh, that is uh, Filippo's imagination, something that's you know very, very nice looking. And uh, the child is altogether more articulated. Uh, uh, this seems okay, uh, but really, the way that shoulder turns and the way his stomach is there, we see his back and his stomach at the same time, and it's not uh, possible to do humanly. Uh, and her arm sort of comes from a place because uh, Filippo didn't care about anatomy or never learned it. But it's a great thing to have this early work. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you see, he first started working with them, and they did two things, the Pliovolo brothers. One, they uh, are supposed to be the first artists uh, who actually did dissections on cadavers to learn anatomy, to learn how the muscles connect to the bones, and you see how they worry about the joints and how they move. They also get credit for being the first to systematically copy poses uh, from uh, classical art, from uh, Roman art especially, but you cannot find a classical frieze of figures that they don't have this pose. Whoa, look! What do you know? Uh, that he is doing something he uh, had to realize, this is what we're doing now. Now, another issue that is uh, raised, the one on the far right is in our show. The one on the far left is in the uh, Art Institute in Chicago. Because of some sort of a powerful effect of 20th century auteur theory of filmmaking, uh, applied to Renaissance paintings, they went through, the scholars, the oeuvre, plural, of uh, all these artists, they said, you know, one is the right one, and the other ones are 
all uh, followers or replicas, and it caused a lot of uh, confusion and misunderstanding of these artists. They, they, had, they had contracts with their students, their apprentices. They had to give them work to do. Perhaps they asked less money uh, for the work if they didn't do it entirely themselves. But this is the way it was. Um, today I received a letter. I still call emails letters. I can't get past that. Uh, I received a letter from Jonathan Nelson, who is the leading authority on Filipino Lippi, the son of Filippo. And he's in Florence, and he has uh, read my catalog, the one that's just come out, and um, uh, basically said how lucky we are that you have entered the field. <laughs> With your sharp eye and lucid writing style. <laughs> it didn't hurt that when I wrote back to his first inquiry, I said, your article is a major contribution that I it's the ratify in my book. <laughs> so I got something back. <laughs> but as a typical example, the picture in Chicago, which uh, early in the 20th century, some Chicago uh, uh, benefactor paid a fortune for this picture. For the last 40 years has been considered a piece of junk because it isn't the early work at right. And it's a wonderful picture. And there's a thousand examples like this, or at least 50, uh, in which they think there's the one prototype and then everything is uh, uh, you know, done by who are these students uh, who are so good. And so I put this in uh, to cover that point too. One of the things we tried to do in the show was to represent everything. A portrait. How do you have a Botticelli show without a portrait? Well, we didn't make that mistake. We <laughs> made a really good one. And uh, now he's left uh, Leapy, and he's mixing it up with the great uh, Florentine painters at his time. He particularly is competing with Ghirlandaio, who uh, paints faster than he does. And uh, he starts making portraits, which are highly sought after, because really, being in the 1460s, people start to make portraits, and before that, nobody had any images at home except the occasional Madonna. And you have to realize we're talking about these images that were the first images that uh, anyone had seen. He is one of the inventors with an artist named Andrea del Castaño of the challenging days. <coughs> he looks at us, why do you deserve my time? Previously, they were just supposed to be historical artifacts. This is what somebody looked like. And they invent the psychology of portraits. Across the, or near this, and across the room from the other early one, is one of the very, very special uh, pictures uh, in the show. Uh, it is literally uh, his most precious work, literally, because um, particle analysis has been done by the museum. They just told me it hasn't been published yet. That's pure lapis lazuli ground and mixed with the tempera, the green is uh, malachite, and the gold is pure gold laid on thickly everywhere. Uh, this must have been for a very special, here are the three nails kind of symbolically, uh, of the passion, crown of thorns, these marvelous halos. And here, as I've said uh, to uh, uh, Folks, as I uh, look at the show with them, here's two days of my life through your now what that is. <laughs> Those are flames. The flames, that is Stella Maris, and those are the flames of the Holy Spirit. And how do you look up things that have never been written? <laughs> uh, that's my problem. But I just looked and looked and looked and looked and looked through photographs. Until uh, Berenson, the great connoisseur, said once, whoever has the most photographs wins. <laughs> the writing in that was uh, a lovely uh, gesture. His hands and hers means he's guiding her. And uh, in the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal review, the writer made a wonderful 
uh, original observation saying he is looking at her, uh, the child, with empathy, uh, knowing the pain that she will suffer. Uh, like the uh, couriers, they credited me with all sorts of things I didn't say. Uh, and that's a lovely remark. I mean, I had been saying, he's saying to her, here's a great part where I'm mentioned. <laughs> I don't think it's as good. <laughs> the newspaper time. Well, another very special thing about this uh, painting, and this is only possible to do in a lecture, that's why we have these lectures. I can't put other photographs on the wall of the exhibition because they will fight for attention with the uh, real works of art. But this, in every way, is stylistically close to the Primavera. And I don't know another work by Monticelli that is this close. She really looks with her golden hair like the fourth grace dancing there. Uh, and uh, that makes it very special to us, because this is this moment of high Laurentian, the adjective from Lorenzo for Lorenzo Magnifico, high Laurentian. Uh, classical uh, philosophy and poetry. This fresco in the show uh, it was the most famous work by him on public view during his lifetime in Florence. And uh, on the basis of this, it caused a sensation. Uh, he was supposed to do it in, uh, uh, he did it in competition with a work by Gerland Dyer. Uh, and it was considered to be a competition that Botticelli won. And an agent for the Duke of Milan was asked to, to summarize who are the best painters in uh, Florence. Ten years later, he said Botticelli is the best painter and because uh, he has a virile manner. Well, this isn't how any of us think of him today, his aria virile. But this work, yes. Uh, for a saint who's wrapped, having a vision, eyes lifting up, he is as uh, virile as uh, could be. Um, the guy looks a little bored. That's not really uh, much competition. This has a whole story that you can uh, read about on the label. Um, on the strength of that uh, fresco, two years later, He's part of the group, he's the leader of the group of Florentine painters who were sent to Rome at the request of the Pope to paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel. And he gets to do three of them and a whole row of uh, uh, pontiffs. And uh, the reason you don't know this work, and even if you've been to the uh, Sistine Chapel and you didn't look at it, is it's a flop. It turns out what he didn't get from his master, Filippo Lippi, was much gift for composing big groups. This is uh, several stories taking place of Moses all at once. It fit the PowerPoint slide so perfectly I couldn't bear to make it smaller, so I wrote over it. And this is Moses, this is Moses, there's Moses taking off his shoes. Moses getting some water, Moses said, I mean, you cannot figure it out. <laughs> and I refuse to learn what these stories are. <laughs> it, it, it really makes no sense. Uh, beautifully fresco. Well, the trip to uh, Rome, he painted three huge things and ten portraits of popes in a year. Uh, and with his assistance, it changed his way of working forever. And for one thing, he got addicted to using assistance. Well, I didn't use it on this one. After seeing Rome, he comes back, and uh, you would think he went to Hollywood. <laughs> he comes back and does this classical sculpture, the famous uh, Venus Pudica, which means modest and uh, she is coming uh, to shore because she represents love and the power of love, which is uh, the Platonic uh, idea of uh, creation. Uh, her arrival here, she is the moving force 
in the universe. So according to uh, that uh, Platonic theory, so she has to be everything. She has to be, yes, uh, as beautiful as a goddess, but also strong and uh, also wise. That's why uh, she's never you know, looking in a come-hither way. She always is, uh, uh, has an inward-looking uh, glance. But the, the solid, large figures right to the front of the uh, um, picture plane, because that is like the classical art they could uh, see. And I put it on here to uh, compare. So now that you have these two works together, and I've explained them to you, you belong to an elite group of scholars who have no difficulty understanding the difference between them. <laughs> and you will never say, I think they're both after the trip to Rome, which is the prevailing view. Now, that's completely unacceptable to us. May I speak for the group? <laughs> Here is uh, what he does for a luxurious Madonna and child after his uh, trip to Rome and uh, all of the classic collections and parties. And uh, I will show you how totally different it is. You know, Roman statues are rather generalized. They don't have uh, uh, great uh, psychologies. They have great cheekbones. How uh, touching the one in which is the last uh, traces of naturalism, the uh, far right one we have on our show. This is the famous Madonna of the Magnificat and would never ever be lent. It's one of considered one of the most precious pictures in the Uffizi. But doesn't the child look like the young Marlon Brando? <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a difference in them. And we have to appreciate every uh, phase of a great artist's work um, of what it is. But honestly, uh, something was lost. Now we have in the show this uh, slender thing, this um, Venus, which is based on the uh, famous painting. And she is uh, very svelte. And she has a kind of a lyrical uh, feeling to her, uh, and uh, she's really rather quite different. We know from contemporary accounts that, quote, he painted uh, beautiful pictures of nude women which one can see in houses uh, in Florence. And we know that uh, amongst uh, the things thrown on the bonfires, of the uh, Verdi, uh, this is still during the lifetime of Lorenzo, so it's not yet, were uh, pictures of uh, sensuous uh, subjects. So we think, everyone thinks, uh, that this one and the other one, which I think it's going to be fun, you'll see the other one that exists and it's very different. Again, we think that they are the two that survive, the ones kept in the closet or under the bed. Uh, because we think there were more than just the two that survived uh, the coming uh, crackdown. Here is the other one. It's in Berlin. Interesting, isn't it? Notice already he uh, changes the hair. The hair on the Venus here is such an important part of the uh, conception of Venus there, and there's the wind, see this is the wind god, and uh, it doesn't uh, happen, and the sway of the body is somewhat different, but I think this one is uh, close in date to ours, and I think by the time it does ours, oh how considerate of me, to <laughs> just get to see them next to each other, and in an exhibition last December in London, they had them next to each other. Uh, that was useful to go and see. Uh, and uh, you see how um, there's a curious, uh, I don't know, poetic or elegiac quality to the one we have. She's even more modest. See, she's wearing that transparent pen noir um, that uh, extends all the way down uh, the folds into the dark shadows. No photograph shows them. 
Uh, here she is all sculptural, because that's what you do when you go to Rome. You learn by looking at sculpture, and here, no sculpture. Uh, a spokesman for sculpture said he was glad no sculpture was involved. At any rate, uh, it's not sculpturesque at all anymore. Look at that hand. How strange, it's so strong and uh, harsh. I have the slightest idea what uh, he was thinking with that uh, wonderful thing. Um, but I wanted now to say, when we uh, uh, opened the box on this, and all the couriers were looking at it, uh, neither of these pictures have ever uh, had particular acceptance as how could they be by him, because they're not the great Birth of the Venus. But this photograph is actually uh, pushed too far. Um, if I knew how to go backwards, I would. I wonder if this would work. No. Nope. Um, Back here. It's very, very uh, subtle, the modeling. And uh, Dr. Groff said to me, you know, we we're all kind of amazed to see it so close up. It's superb, actually. Superb. And he said, uh, how much of this do you think is by him? I said, nearly all of it. Uh, it didn't even look that good. The attitude of a person who hangs up a picture affects how you feel when you look at it. Well, this is uh, around the same time, and this uh, is an interesting thing. It's a new subject. They didn't paint these on things. They got these subjects from the works of the previous century, the 1300s, the most important literary century in the history of the world anywhere. Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. They write all the uh, mythological encyclopedias, that, and also Boccaccio writes a completely licentious uh, book uh, of stories called the Decameron. You can't finish it because they're all the same, really. Um, this is unusual that the three goddesses, Paris, the uh, shepherd, must uh, choose who is the uh, most beautiful, Venus, um, Juno, or Minerva, and or vice versa. He has, for unknown reasons, not done anything to identify them. We only figure this is uh, Aphrodite or Venus because we know she won. <laughs> Uh, what is this back here? But these are very familiar Roman monuments. Rome did not exist. But in this interesting literary uh, bias of the time of uh, uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico, um, this event leads to him receiving the hand of uh, Helen of Troy, who they forgot to vet her. And it turned out she was married to King Menelaus. <laughs> and the Greeks had to get in chips and go to Troy to get her back. When Troy burned, Aeneas fled and found in Rome. So this shows what will happen, which is uh, very literary. It's also something that was made as the back panel of a bench. This is a wedding chest, the story of Psyche, by a pupil and a follower of Botticelli. And uh, you know she's dressed in white, so her, 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 her sisters are saying, "Oh, you better look into that guy, uh, your husband." Now we come to the last part of the show. Uh, we have this uh, marvelous um, Christ. It's a shaped cross painted on a cut-out cross. That's what we call it, and. Uh, the great thing about this uh, work is it's not in any book because it was never accepted. And when I asked the leading expert who helped us very much on this show, uh, uh, Alessandro Cech, he, he said, he's one who said, go to the corner of the tiny little museum attached to the cathedral of Prato. There's a crucifix there that I swear is Barcelli. And when uh, Dr. Graf and I saw it, we go, whoa. What a thing, 100% is this thing. And I said, why is it not in any book? They said, because Botticelli wouldn't paint such a subject. <laughs> really? What are we, psychologists now? <laughs> I mean, he painted it. That's all you need to know. It's very, very beautiful. 
And as I studied it, I uh, went back on a visit and showed this photograph of a well-known work to uh, Dr. Checky, because he had dated it to the mid-90s. And uh, look, uh, it's 91 and 93. Look at ours here. See, these dates don't come with them. We decide them. <laughs> he is beautiful in a way of the beautiful uh, figures we've been saying, unmarked by the trauma of the passion, all of this has to do with the court of Lorenzo Magnifico. And the other one, notice they're not these wonderful contours. It's, uh, um, it's a more tragic, a more tragic treatment of the subject, and a little bit repetitious, but the legs are parallel, uh, not at all. And, uh, you know, when you show a great scholar something like this and say, you know, so I think uh, you published the wrong date. I didn't phrase it that way. <laughs> he said, you're right. <laughs> oh, and that's why I pointed out, because it doesn't happen often enough. <laughs> <laughs> and that's we're adding to the knowledge there. Now, Botticelli uh, is not ex said to have influenced any uh, artists after him. He just dies without leaving any trace. Uh, but, uh, in fact, uh, his friend, who was 30 years younger, they had the same protector, and uh, he was one of the few people, one of the other, that Michelangelo respected. He didn't get along with anyone. He carved this uh, crucifix for Santo Spirito in the same spirit uh, that the beauty of Christ, it's an idea that really shows. Mm -hmm. Wow. I found how to go backwards. <laughs> Here we go. He uh, did it the same way. <laughs> Uh, with uh, no trauma, uh, just the, this comes from a phrase that's on the label for this work. It comes from um, Augustine's narratives on the Psalms, in which he says, "God is beautiful in entering this life, in leaving this life, in the tomb, on the cross. God is beautiful," and that's the theme here. Now, this is not a late work, it's 88, the late works begin with the 90s, but you see the wall there, this is the work we put before uh, the late works to show that his uh, identification with these great Christmas, uh, Christmas Christian uh, themes uh, was uh, part of him. Uh, this is uh, the funeral mask. They said, would you like the funeral mask of uh, Lorenzo Magnificent? So Aaron and I said, sure, go to the back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is great. And uh, this, here's a picture of him uh, from life by a girl in Dyer. And uh, after his death, the government of the city was taken over by uh, Fra Samarola. And uh, that uh, spelled a very uh, tragic climate mm -hmm. in uh, the city. And here's a late work. We have an altarpiece in the exhibition. It's very, very hard to obtain altarpieces on loan. And what happens in these late works, I see this photograph also is pushed a little bit. That annoys me so much. Um, but you can see that... Uh, This voluminous outline is one of the signs of his late style. It looks like it's been blown up. He removes the weight he re uh, from the body. He removes their physical presence. He wants them to represent who they are, but he's not pretending anymore that they're illusions. He gives a back away all the wonderful Renaissance things about perspective and uh, volume. And he looks back uh, to medieval <coughs> and the quality of his first rate. This is the face of St. John in that altarpiece. This is as great as Botticelli, you know, gets. It's a fantastic piece of painting. And this work, too, is always just called workshop. I mean, well, let's have a look at them before we uh, decide what they are. Look how wonderful, I won't leave the microphone, how wonderful sort of impressionistic 
the light doesn't hit this part of the uh, his mustache, just these first ones. I mean, it's just an instinctive understanding of how we see. Artists of all times uh, had to be aware of uh, that our vision is optical and also mental. Uh, this work should not be yellow like this, but this was the least yellow photo I could find in it. They are very pallid, and as uh, the people who have seen the show and read the label, or um, had a chance to come on a, one of the tours, the docents are giving excellent tours, this is a remarkable late work by him. Notice how it's all completely flat now. The, the, she, if she stood up, she'd hit her head on the frame. <laughs> it's all fit in the way of a medieval uh, illuminated manuscript, and the rose bower behind her was straight down. No wonder the pre-Raphaelites and late 19th century English loved uh, Botticelli, um, and they have a version of this in the city of Birmingham, in fact. And uh, it's so strange because in the meeting of the cousins, Christ and his cousin, the Baptist, you know, normally it's a moment, Leonardo da Vinci does it several times, Michelangelo does it, uh, of a little lightheartedness, uh, you know, a uh, Christian play date. Uh, but instead, they seem very somber. And uh, actually, look at uh, the infant's hand. He seems to be consoling the Baptist, and the Baptist uh, seems more appropriate, his sadness, to a leave-taking. And she is very solemn because she always knows what's happening. It, at that time, it was easy for them to see. Uh, if we have a lot of experience of Italian painting, we can see this strange pose of holding the child sideways and lowering him evokes the deposition from the cross. So imposed on a scene, basically, of the nativity is the passion. As one happens, uh, in order to lead to the sacrifice. And here I'm uh, concluding. Um, this is a uh, work, again, in his late style. And this was in a the Poli Pizzoli Museum, which lent that wonderful refined Madonna with the book. And uh, this was in an important, very ancient, centrally placed church in uh, Florence. And this is an early work, unfinished by Michelangelo, that uh, no one has ever had any idea where he got this idea that, uh, for the figures to be weightless and floating around. But everyone in this room now knows more than all the books. <laughs> this is exactly where he got the idea from, and uh, one of his followers, Pantormo, made a very great uh, painting of the same subject in the Church of Santa Felicita in Florence, based on this. So he did have a uh, tremendous influence. <clears throat> and that leads me to <coughs> conclude this attempt to explain to you the artistic and spiritual journey of Botticelli. Thank you.